Thank you. Thank you all for spending your Saturday with us, your precious Saturday morning and afternoon. We have the pleasure of being the last panel for this conference, and we'll be touching on the topic of investing, you know, in alternative investing. So what exactly is alternative investing? Or alts, as we know, short form as alts, right? So it's not a traditional asset class, as most of you might know, of like equities and bonds. Uh, it tends to be Ill illiquid in nature and also not publicly traded and higher minimums when it comes to investing. Um, but you know, there are many people like for example, pension funds and also endowments and also high net worth individuals have always been investing in this space. And as you heard in the previous panel from Joy, she also mentioned that pension funds have allocated 20% and even up to 40% into alternatives. So in recent years, a lot of individual investors have garnered interest in this space. And that is largely because platforms such as Endowers have started offering access into alternatives. And also, secondly, there have also been, you know, fund houses that have been providing semi-liquid, semi... Hi. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, so fund houses have also been providing semi-liquid structures um, to make, you know, everything a bit more liquid and also having, you know, uh, the funds registered for retail audiences so that you know, more people can actually invest into it. So before we begin, maybe I'll hand it over to the panel to do you know, a 30 second round of introductions before we begin. Over to you, maybe Melanie first. Sure, thank you so much, Cheryl. All good on the mic? Yeah. Yeah, good. Very good afternoon and thank you for having me here today. My name is Melanie. I'm from UBS Asset Management. I've been with the firm for about eight years. Um, in the early parts of my career, I cut my teeth as a financial advisor at the local banks. I've spent about eight years um, working in local banks and another 15 years um, with asset management firms. So indeed, the pleasure to be here to speaking to all of you today. Thank you, Melanie. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Pin and I'm a partner at Lightspeed Ventures. Um, we invest uh, in, uh, in startups, like household names that you hear today, like Grab, Snapchat, you know, all your rooms, uh, but 10 years ago, right? So um, it's an asset class called Venture, um, and it is a very high risk one, so I'm happy to um, uh, share more today. Um, and as a full disclosure, we are also an investor in Dawa, so to the extent that I, um, I should disclose that, uh, and, and also that I'm not a certified financial advisor, but I'm more than happy to share how, at least for me as a venture investor, I you know, kind of manage my, my personal portfolio. So glad to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Dominic, uh, partner at TPG, um, based here in Singapore. I've been with the firm 18 years, which has been my entire professional investing career, um, and these days co-head our business in Southeast Asia. Uh, TPG is one of the world's largest alternative asset managers. Uh, we have about $150 billion under management, um, mostly in what we would call private equity, and as we talk more this afternoon, uh, we'll unpack a little bit what that is, but good to be here. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Jeremy and I'm the general manager at MDAC, uh, covering corporate finance and strategy. Um, MDAC is a B2B focused fintech, uh, specially focused on cross-border transactions uh, in foreign exchange and payments. So prior to moving into fintech, I spent 18 years as an investment banker, uh, looking after Southeast Asia, doing IPOs and M&A. So I'm an avid investor, and I'm uh, also an, an endowed client. Yes, I'm pretty sure everyone will find you familiar, Jeremy. <laughs> You're an endowed advocate as well. Yeah, so Melanie, if you could start us off, you know, could you maybe give us you know, an introduction of you know, what exactly is this asset class alternatives? Um, how does it differ from traditional asset classes that we're more familiar with? And also, how can clients or investors think about adding this into the portfolio? When do they start adding this into their portfolio? I think the mic is going on an early weekend break. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, as Cheryl, as you alluded to earlier, in terms of alternative investments, when most of us think about investments, we, we tend to think about traditional financial instruments like your bonds, equities. But that is actually a whole array of um, uh, alternative investments that are actually unconventional securities. You have, for example, your private equity, hedge funds, um, commodities, as well as private debt. So I'm going to break it down in terms of four by four to everyone. So there are actually broadly um, 
four common alternative investment strategies. The first one is private equity. Private equity, as the name suggests, is private. It's capital invested into unlisted, um, um, unlisted, and where you get actually a premium um, over over equity or ownership. And at the same time. Um, Investors who invest in private equity go for, they actually get um, uh, higher returns at the same time. The second option is, uh, the second alternative strategy is uh, private debt. So similar to private equity, this is actually capital invested into debts of companies. So managers invest in private debt to restructure debt, to um, also restructure default debt, for example, as well. The Third category is real estate. So real estate in terms of residential, commercial, industrial types of real estate, either in primary or secondary um, real assets. So as for, for managers like us at UBS Asset Management, we invest in real estate um, via a variety of areas. For example, we can buy into properties where for refurbishing, we can buy into properties for development projects or repositioning projects. And this actually has been actually known as a good inflation hedge for investors' portfolios. The fourth category is hedge funds. Now, um, I'm not sure how many of you are born in 1949, or most of us, actually, if I look across the floor, many of you are not born then. Now, Alfred Winston Jones, he's the man, if you Google it, he's the guy who created the hedge fund strategy in 1949. And why he did that um, back then was because there was a lot of uncertainty amongst economies, how the markets would turn out. And his idea behind developing a strategy was to have a strategy that is not correlated to markets and to generate stable returns. So his approach was to do something very simple as buying into unvalued companies, right? And also short sell into overvalued companies. And with that, he's actually taking a profit from the difference between the two. Now, this approach is actually designed to have returns that's all correlated to the market direction as long as you're buying the right stocks, as long as you're buying the right companies. And that's how the word hedge originated. And that's how hedge funds, since this was launched in 19, the first launch was in 1949, we have seen trillions of assets in uh, assets and the management for hedge funds. And today we have easily about 10,000 hedge funds being created. Now, so Four by four, I've talked about the four categories, private equity, private debt, real estate, as well as hedge funds. Now, I'm going to also briefly talk about the various types of hedge fund strategies. Now, in hedge fund strategies, as I mentioned in, in um, uh, the, the example earlier in terms of buying into over or undervalued companies and short selling overvalued companies, that is actually an equity long shot hedge strategies. On the credit aspect, the second area, we could also do the same thing, except that you actually long and short into fixed income securities credit. The third is actually on, um, we call it relative value. Now, relative value, RV, as is known. Uh, in short, basically, is where arbitrators, they buy into, they look for mispriced assets. They buy into assets that are mispriced, hoping to take advantage of the price discrepancy and assuming that these securities actually return back to true value. Last but not least, the fourth is actually on trading. Trading is an actually a very interesting strategy whereby in, um, fund managers like ourselves, we also buy, um, invest into trading uh, uh, approaches using either quantitative uh, and buying into very highly liquid instruments. So in a nutshell, there are also various types of hedge fund strategies um, depending on client's profile, experience, etc. And I think, Cheryl, your question also was about um, when should investors look into investing uh, hedge funds, right? Mm -hmm. So, or alternatives for that matter. In terms of when, um, bear in mind that for when it comes to alternative investment strategies, it comes with certain form of illiquidity, right? And if you have that tolerance for illiquidity, um, and also at the same time that risk appetite to be able to stomach um, uh, uh, higher higher risk as well, then the timing should be any time. Looking at it from an SAA TA per, uh, perspective. Thank you, Melanie. I mean, you, you gave a very good in-depth you know view about hedge funds, but maybe now we can move on to you know pin what you're doing best at, right? <laughs> Lightspeed is, uh, you know, one of the, you know, early investors in a lot of good startups and venture capital firms. Maybe if you could share with the audience here, what exactly is a venture capital firm? Is it something that individual investors can invest into? And on top of that, 
when you actually look at investing to a VC firm, for example, what do you actually look out for? Um, so maybe Hello, this is good? Yeah. Okay. This one hasn't gone to lunch yet. Good mic. <laughs> um, so maybe as a you know, just a quick one oh one, I would broadly, you know, say that venture asset class is a subset of a private equity, right? It's just a much smaller scale, um, much more, a much higher risk. Um, so I'd say I'll categorize that as uh, underneath. So I guess people who have access to it today at least still are, you know, um, high net worth individuals, uh, pension funds, and, you know, or and, and endowment funds, uh, you know, uh, for, for uh, mostly in the US or um, firms like GIC, Tomasic. So these are typical clients of, you know, um, venture firms, right? So um, just a quick 101 of what we do. Um, and traditional venture firms invest really in technology-driven innovation uh, companies, right? So if you just take households names that you hear today, Grab, Snapchat, um, All Your Rooms, Pintoto, Alibaba, these were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, really companies that were just started by two to three people in a garage, right? To, um, I was an early member of Grab um, 10 years ago. This, the company was valued at $15 million, right? Today it's trading on NASDAQ for what, maybe as of yesterday, $15 billion, right? So this is the kind of journey. And essentially what we, you know, in the top quartile, you know, um, venture firms, we hope to return or give a return of about 40%, you know, year and year compounded. And you know, obviously, obviously the next question is then, wow, this is a great return. Why aren't everybody in venture asset class? Because there's risk, right? Many people, we only hear um, the, the heroic uh, success stories, right? Gojek, Tokopedia, you know, Grab, Facebook, Amazon, all these are the success stories of venture, uh, venture uh, firms. But um, along the way, not many people know that um, to, every, to find even one Facebook, you know, there were, you know, 90 others that didn't make it, didn't you know, make it into news. So, so the reason why not everyone should be investing in venture, venture uh, uh, asset class is because there's risk, there's inherent risk, and the inherent risk is much higher than what you would probably get in ter when you're investing in you know, maybe more later stage you know, private equity firms, uh, private equity uh, asset class, or even stocks or bond, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's uh, basically what we do and why at least as our firm, you know, believe it's, you know, many people have different strategy, like our, our strategy as a global venture firm is really to, um, you know, go on a journey with these founders very early um, and provide them with really not just money, but time and resources and, you know, our network that we can bring with, you know, kind of the global brand to really change the trajectory, like really to change the tra trajectory of these investments or these founders, right? So, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of 101 what we do. Thank you, Pin. So when you're actually meeting all these VC firms, right, there are so many of them, what do you actually look out for? What stands out? Sorry, just to clarify, as I, day to day I, I meet founders, right? Founders, so invest, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, um, and I, maybe I'll just use Endow as an example because, again, uh, full transparency, we're an investor in, in the firm, right? Uh, a few things. One is, um, uh, you know, a very, very big market, right? So um, I, I do not invest in, you know, the, even the most high-flying bubble tea store, right? Like, like, like bubble tea store for me, even if you, they return amazing money, it is not a category that is, you know, suitable for a venture asset class. Because for me, once again, if I, every only one in a hundred will make it to Facebook, then I think every time I invest, I need to like really think if there is a possibility that this could, you know, give me, uh, could cover, I'd say, at least in, internally I would speak, a very large surface area, right? So maybe some person starts with, I'm um, with Endowas, which they started with just helping you invest in CPF, but I need to really imagine that, you know, one day, you know, we'll be, the, um, you know, Sam and Greg and his team would be able to go beyond just helping people invest in CPF, but to also invest in, you know, the money markets and to invest in, you know, the private equity firms and to have conferences like this. So I guess my kind of vision turned out to be true, <laughs> but that's a little bit about, you know, what we look for, uh, like a very big market, maybe a, a, a wedge, and then you know something that we can eventually, hopefully, right? If I, I, again, I invest a lot in consumer net companies, hopefully, like yeah, you know, one in five people on the road should 
has the potential to, to use this um, uh, and, you know, uh, as part of their life's journey. So that's number one, a very big market. And then number two is really just a team. Um, there is, there's good team and then there's great team, right? I, I think a great team really um, takes the form of, you know, at least again, just sharing a venture speak. You look for team and market fit, not you know, every student or not every person with an HBS degree or come out of, you know, you know, a tech executive a ten, who spent 10 years in DBS, the best performing DBS executive. These are not necessary clear signs of good teams, right? Good teams depends on what they're working on and why they have an edge in doing what they do, right? So, uh, Again, just taking an example of Endowas, I think the founding team was a great combination of someone who, you know, like Sam, who has had years and years of experience in, in really asset advisory and asset management, right? And he has the drive and the grit to really want to make a big difference. It's not incremental, right? It has to be huge change to the industry. Um, and then he, his team up with, you know, Greg, who has spent, again, multiple years, right, with, in, in, you know, came from Hong Kong, and his family, like, is really in deep in, has deep knowledge in, you know, wealth management. He spent a lot of time in Grab and, you know, really understand kind of how to move the really bits together to make this work, right? And I think that combination, at least for me, is a very powerful combination. It's a very good starting point. The risks are still there, the work is still hard, but I think it's a very good starting point to build what I actually believe is going to be kind of the next wealth platform of Asia. Thank you, Pin. Now moving on to, you know, private equity 101. Right, uh, Dominic, your your partner in TBG, where you know you, you run many PE funds, but could you maybe break it down a little bit for us to let the audience here understand a little bit more about what exactly is private equity? Uh, it tends to be a little bit less opaque in terms of disclosure when it comes to investing into companies as compared to, I would say, investing into a public equity. Right. So how, how can clients or investors think about this? And also we hear, I know a lot of questions in one. We also hear this term GPLP very often. Could you just, you know, explain to us what, what that is about? Sure. I guess a few topics in there. So I'll, I'll try to take it bit by bit. As, as Pin said, um, you know, VC is really a subset of private equity, which is a subset of the broader alternative asset space. And the private equity industry has been around now for probably 50 years or so. Um, it just wasn't called private equity when it first began. Uh, when it first began, you know, it was a group of people who would spot an investment opportunity, usually something that wasn't available in the public markets, and then they would gather a group of investors together um, to make that investment. And so to be able to make large investments, it meant gathering money from usually pension funds, possibly insurance companies, um, who had the ability to deploy large amounts of money. As, as the industry has, has grown and matured, it, it's come to be known as private equity. And uh, the, these days, as well as gathering money from pension funds and insurance companies still, uh, we're also gathering money from sovereign wealth funds, but also wealthier individuals. Uh, and increasingly, um, you know, through various different means, also there are ways for uh, people to access private equity at even uh, smaller check sizes. Um, what we do, which is you know different to what PIN does, is um, you know I, I would love to be able to generate 40% returns, but the returns are probably more like 20 to 25%. But the reason for that is we're taking less risk, um, and in taking less risk, we would really be investing only in the best of the companies that graduate from a VC firm. Um, and if I could take an example. That, that you might all be familiar with, which is Property Guru. Um, it's now a listed company uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, but when we first invested in that was about eight years ago, uh, before we invested, various VC firms have invested in the company. So it's, it had sort of proven its ability to make money. Um, by the time we invested, we helped the business expand into multiple markets, you know, and now it's a profitable cash generating company that's available for people to invest in, in the public markets. And so it's a good example of how a business can graduate from VC to private equity uh, to public markets. The other reason I raise that example is what we're trying to create for investors is things that they can't necessarily access in the public markets. Um, you know, people are not going to um, pay us fees uh, to do something that they can go and do uh, in the public markets by themselves. I think this is a little bit where the transparency point comes in as well. And I think, you know, we, we often, um, 
you know, hear it that we're, uh, private equity is not a very transparent uh, investment category. And I think that that comment is fair in some respects and, and unfair in others. And, and what I mean by that is if you invest in the public markets, you get a fair bit of information about how your company is performing every quarter or every half year. They will publish quite detailed financial statements. The, the question is, though, what are you going to do with that information? Um, you, you can only make a decision to continue to hold your investment or possibly to sell your investment, um, but there's really no ability to you know, influence what the company is going to do, at least as an individual investor. Um, when you have a private equity manager and you invest with us, from where we sit, we get a tremendous amount of transparency into what our companies are doing. So we would usually sit on the board of the company. In some cases, we would control the company. And the level of detail that we get um, is, is much, much more um, than what you would get as an investor in a public company. Um, and so we get a tremendous amount of transparency. And we think a lot of, before we make an investment in a company about how is the governance of that company, how is their, the quality of their own information, how tra transparent are they with us when we're considering making the investment. So we, in a way, you're sort of outsourcing that, that transparency to us. The reporting that we give back to our investors is on a portfolio basis um, because you know, we're putting together a portfolio of companies and we're very transparent about our own returns. Um, but admittedly, the amount of information you get about each individual company um, will be less uh, than if you're investing in, in the public markets. I think the, la the last of your questions was uh, around sort of a GP and LP, which is a term that, that you hear quite a lot. Um, and the acronyms mean general partner and limited partner. Um, that probably doesn't help answer the question though. And these, go, these acronyms go back to the very beginning of the industry when these clubs were coming together to do deals and they were typically structured as partnerships. Uh, and the best way I could sort of simplify it, I think, is think of the general partner as the manager and think of the limited partner as the investors. Um, and, and really what it means is the general partner has the discretion as to when to buy the investment, how to manage the investment, when to sell the investment, and the limited partners or the investors uh, in, enjoy the returns from the investment. Thank you, Dominic. Now I think the most important <laughs> part is how do we apply what we have learned from the panel here, right? So Jeremy, we really need your help there. So as an individual investor, what are some of the learning points that you have made throughout your investing journey, especially when it comes to alternative investing? Any, you know, what, what sort of risk do you think we, you know, all of us should be thinking about? And how, how do we view risk reward when it comes to investing in such a space? Okay. Great. So the title of this talk is Alternative Investing 101. So I feel like I am the 101 here. I'm the, I'm the basic guy, right? Um, but I can share quite a bit about my personal experience uh, investing in alternatives. Um, so I, I've done uh, personal investing on the side, uh, on a seed stage, um, angel investing. Um, and I've done this in uh, tech startups, uh, in apps, uh, like what PIN does. But clearly, um, at that time, it was so exciting. I got involved and I got friends to uh, did fundraise and I went to invest and I was very involved in go to market strategy and what you should do. So it's an app for like food. It's something like Hungry Go Where at that time, many years back. But guess what? Um, after a while, uh, it basically died. So I lost all my money and so did my, my um, syndicated friends that I brought into the investment. So that was my first uh, experience in, uh, I say, early stage investment. Later on in life, I was approached uh, to do a, a Series B uh, in, in investment into a solar company. So I was like, yeah, okay, this sounds pretty interesting. Solar, renewable, uh, many years ago as well. So it's a Singapore company. So I put in money, I invested. This time around, I was smart. I didn't get anyone to join me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to bear the risk. Um, so I, I did an investment, and uh, this one turned out well. I actually made money. So I made about 2.8 times money and money over five years. Um, the, the exit was that this company was uh, via a trade sale to a Spanish company, uh, recently reported in a newspaper. So that was pretty nice. So I had my first taste of uh, a PE-type investment, right? I would say growth equity. Um, and from my experience, uh, I enjoyed the investing experience, but I felt like the key takeaways is that there's a lot of concentration risk if I'm just doing it on my own. 
So I put in one asset or one bond. You know, you're really exposed to that particular underlying asset and its performance. And if you don't have time to track it, um, I think your time is better spent you know, focusing on your real job, right? So for, for me, that was one. And I guess in, in, in uh, investing in, in this asset class as well, a lot of the times it's, it's about access. So um, I was very interested in hedge funds and also PE, but a lot of the uh, funds are not open to, I guess, retail or AI, and the, and the fund requirement is quite high. It's a very high capital outlay. So even for the Series B investment that I did, it was fairly uh, lumpy capital outlay. And that, again, increases your concentration risk based on your own personal portfolio. So I feel like these challenges with the world today and the technology that's available uh, can be mitigated by having a platform where I can go in and the minimum investment size is lower so I get to see what all the choices are, and I can spread out, right? Like what was mentioned uh, earlier about the four buckets. I can put a bit in PE, I can put some in private credit, um, and maybe some in VC, and I can tailor that. Uh, back then, many years ago, when I started this investing journey, uh, we didn't have that option. And so I just dabbled my hand uh, in it. And I guess also in alternative asset class, I, I did dabble also in crypto. Um, so uh, I, I managed to do some DeFi, yield farming, you know, staking coins. I also got burned, right? So, so right now, I, I mean, personally, I, I limit my uh, exposure to this asset class uh, to about 5 to 8% of overall portfolio, but it is an exciting asset class. Uh, right now, uh, I am doing a bit more research personally on the private credit space. I was just asking ChatGPT yesterday some questions. Um, so still learning, uh, still enjoying the journey, uh, and clearly I think that the panel here have hopefully shared much more than my basic one-on-one. Thank you, Jeremy. I think you had some foresight because one of the second top voted questions was actually about cryptocurrencies. <laughs> And I think you adequately answered the question. So I'll go to the top most voted question in undoubtedly it's about fees, right? So in the alternative space, especially hedge funds and also private equity, the fees tend to be higher than you know, as compared to buying an ETF or buying an index tracking fund. So comments from from the panel in terms of like are these fees warranted? Dominic looks like you're it, the best person for uh, this. Question. It, it, it depends on the returns. Um, so look, I, I, would, I would look at it as what returns do you get as an investor? Um, and if you're in you know, a top quartile private equity fund, it, it should be more than a 20% return even after fees. Um, it will be higher than that, obviously, for a VC fund. Um, in our industry, there are two parts to the fees. There is a percentage of assets under management. Um, and usually the bigger the fund, the smaller that percentage will be. But then probably the more important part is uh, what we call our carried interest, which is a percentage of the profits. And that's actually the bigger piece of the fees. Um, and it means that we're very well aligned with investors because we only get those fees uh, if the investments are profitable, usually over uh, some sort of hurdle return, um, which I think is, is different to um, perhaps a more passive investing style where the incentive for the manager is to grow AUM. Um, as opposed to how profitable that, that uh, AUM happens to be. Thank you, Dominic. I think the next question, maybe Melanie, if you could help us out on, is about asking what are additional benefits um, such as hedge funds? Uh, how does it provide, uh, you know, long-term, you know, help to achieve long-term goals for retirement, let's say? Does not need to be particularly hedge funds, can be also private equity or any of the alternative space. Sure. Maybe I can touch a bit about some of the trends that we're seeing from a UBS EM perspective. And we've really seen an acceleration in terms of clients allocating to alternatives. And we've recently also commissioned a survey to understand what are our clients and what are our investors thinking of. And I think the common driver behind the decision to invest more into alternatives has been diversification. That's really, really the free lunch here, isn't it? In terms of the ability if you diversify across not just traditional bonds, um, and, and equities. Now, so within the alternatives um, strategies, the type of alternative strategies, what we've really seen also is, 
or more into alternative mutual funds. So the more liquid type of strategies as well, um, that's actually has been also um, uh, taking up a lot of interest. And to that point also, I was very um, intrigued by the survey results that uh, fellow speaker uh, Gayton from Amundi mentioned, uh, shown earlier, where he actually showed the chart in terms of investors' appetite for alternatives. And I was particularly honing in on that bar chart that, that actually showed that um, uh, high net worth investors versus retail investors. And the allocation of alternatives of retail investors actually is at zero, if I'm not wrong. Whereas compared to high net worth individuals, it is actually at a significant, I think it's a 35 or 36 percent uh, allocation to alternatives. So that actually, again, it, it goes back to, the, to, to what we commonly see, right? Many jurisdictions actually limit the availability of uh, alternative investings to retail investors. It's typically more catered towards the invested, institutional investors or even the accredited high net worth uh, individual investors. And that's because of also the higher risk element to alternative investments. However, in Singapore, we've seen that actually within the asset management landscape, um, alternative fund sales actually has grown significantly in the past years vis-a-vis -vis traditional. All right? And my point here is that um, Despite the, the overall more education about alternatives, uh, I think retail investors have actually only started because um, traditionally all this while um, alternative investment has been actually more suited, more catered towards the high net worth and institutional investors, right? But um, back, to, back to what we're seeing also as well in terms of the um, trend that's dominating diversification and and as AIA um, CIO earlier, Chun Yen, she mentioned, right, the, with the fragility and the macro uncertainty likely going to drive markets, we will likely see more and more interest in this space as well because alternatives do provide uh, a better return stream as well, uncorrelated, of course, um, uh, being risk aware about that aspect as well. Um, so I think this is a trend that will continue to stay. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll probably take another last one or two last questions from the audience. And uh, I think, Pin, you can probably help us out on this because it's very specific to startups. What are the financial matrix to use when evaluating investing in startups, especially when they are still not profitable and still cash flow negative? Good question. So I think it really varies, uh, you know, from the, from, from business to businesses, right? So, you know, we'll then, everybody fundamentally wants a profitable company, free cash flow, that's hopefully very, very scalable, at least in venture asset class. And so the journey to that obviously has different drivers, right? If you are a wealth tech company, then it could be driven by the number of customers that you are, you know, adding on uh, year on year, day to day, month to month, right? Um, you're also looking at, you know, uh, AUM um, per user, right? So, you, you you know, how much are individuals putting onto your platform and is that growing over time? If you're an e-commerce company, obviously, then there's a different whole different metrics, right? Like how many merchants have you onboarded? How active are your customers? How many of them are, you know, profitable customers? How many of them are, you know, loss-making customers? And, you know, you, then you can use these underlying metrics to project towards sort of hopefully, you know, two, three years or you know, 10 year time frame, um, as you think about it, to kind of keep the company um, focused at least, all right, on a path that will hopefully create a lot of free cash flow in a highly scalable way, right? Again, this is not about a business that will take, you know, 20, 30 years to get to, you know, $20 billion outcome, right? Our fund cycle or our, 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 our investment uh, horizon is hopefully in 10 years, right? In 10 years, I find, you know, I invest something and hopefully 10 years, it becomes a graph, right? So that's a little bit of how, you know, we think about it and what are the drivers that we are looking for in the early days and then um, what we hope for, right, in, in the later days. And I will also say that a lot of the metrics in the early stage startups are qualitative. Again, I said I say this because a lot of time is really about the founder. So we look, we take a lot of time to do founder references. You know, we, you know, this is like two hours of me spending time with them and really debating on you know the market, the product decisions, the trade-off that it's going to make. And these are like I would say qualitative measures. So I would just go back to um, actually, you know, uh, Jeremy, you made a really good point um, about 
why I think the difference between Jeremy and myself and Dom is not that individually we are any smarter, right? Or, but actually, the difference between you know three of us is actually between Dom and myself have a large team really behind working for us to give us you know information, right? Sourcing and 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 you know uh, to give us time to evaluate and be with the founder and you know and and understand the problems and how kind of help them problem solve and eventually also to help them exit, right? So these are this is really the only reason why I actually for example don't invest in any other funds um, in my own asset class because I, I believe my firm Lightspeed is is you know top quartile firm but when I invest you know I obviously have an asset allocation that is you know in growth equity in bonds in you know uh, stock markets and actually a lot of time you know and that's why I think Endowas has been such a uh, crucial part of my financial journey is because I believe in any other asset class there is a dom that does better than this you know there's a you know uh, it, there's a Dominic that does is a better you know does it better than me, and I'm sure if I have to invest, you know, I'm not sure I'm not familiar with what you do, Jeremy. If you know you are the top quarter at what you do, I will also allocate my you know money accordingly. So that's really really the philosophy, or at least my personal view on why we should you know access certain funds, you know, or get advice from certain people, right? It's like. You know, if you everybody can teach Chinese tuition, but you're not Barry. Like, go to Barry's, right? If you want <laughs> good Chinese outcome, so that's a little bit about yeah. at least my personal, you know, investment philosophy or asset allocation philosophy. Yeah, we've actually come up to time, <laughs> but I will take the last question. You know, just bear with me. It's asking about what alternative investment options does Endowers have? I just have to answer this question, right? So we do offer hedge funds and private markets, uh, you know, funds on our platform, and they tend to be semi-liquid in nature. We do have offerings for accredited investors and also for our retail clients. So please do approach the client advisor team. They are, they are all around the floor and outside. And also please approach our investment office folks. They are also here as well. And so on that note, I just want to thank you all the panels for all your insightful, you know, comments and views and thank you.